Hey, family. Dr. Rebecca Swartzlos is a cognitive neuroscientist, and she's done some incredible work in this field. She works primarily with children, and her new book, book Brainscapes, is one that you've really got to get. Right now, join me in an incredible conversation with her about this particular area of science and how it can impact our lives, not just how it has done it. Welcome, Dr. Becca. Rebecca, so your book, wow, are you excited about this? I mean, what was your journey into authorship, Brainscapes? Whoa. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, it was um, it was a long journey. I think this book, probably from beginning to end, it took me about 10 years to conceptualize and create. But um, uh, it really was, I, I felt like it was a story that, that, that needed to be told and that hadn't really been told to the, the general audience to a general group of people and and so it was something that you know in neuroscience we we know about some many of these ideas some some of them for a very long time um but they really are powerful ideas for all of us to understand in terms of understanding ourselves and our um and other aspects of our society there couldn't be a better time for your book to be out okay we've all come through so much that people haven't understood people have said uh, just every every emotion you can imagine and i'm sure you're going to tie us into how neurologically that is happening for people and how they can get to the place they need to be at some point in this conversation but you know i'm really interested to find out what about your growing up led you here i mean what what type of little girl were you to become such an incredible scientist. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I was a very inquisitive child. Um, I was an avid reader and, um, you know, pretty nerdy. Uh, I, I think I had my collection of cicada husks in my room that I would look at and, <laughs> you know, weird, you know, curiosities. So I just always- so, was... so, so, so for, Listen now, we are, we are across the globe. You've got to share our cicada husks with people so they know what you're talking about. Uh -huh, yeah. Well, it's just a, you know, a large insect and it sheds its, its husk every uh, once in a while. So little things like that, that I would find nature, um, um, features of nature um, that uh, I kind of found fascinating. Um, so I guess I was, I was sort of inclined in that direction very early on, but I was really interested, particularly in, in the mind and brain. Um, both, you know, it's all of us have the pleasure of getting to think about the mind and brain from our own first person vantage point. Um, but I was also very interested, you know, having kind of life experience kind of with kind of the way that mental illness can can interrupt and interfere with um, um, kind of how the brain works and sort of seeing and in loved ones and, and friends that this is, um, you know, this brain that we have is a physical thing that that we live in and we have our world in, but we also, you know, it can be affected by something as simple as you know a pill and it can kind of change how we think and feel and that was such a fascinating um thing for for me thinking about growing up how how does this funny little organ work yeah because most kids aren't even thinking about brain i mean brain comes into conversation in a classroom or they hear it used idiomatically you know, uh, uh, but not in any detail. There are two questions I got to jump into with you. Uh, and the first one, Rebecca, is more about when we hear a lot today around uh, mental illness and mental wellness, emotional illness and emotional wellness, which can be very different. I've seen people considered mentally ill be quite emotionally happy within themselves. Um, and I've seen that uh, recently, as a matter of fact, quite dramatically. So that first question is, is there a space between wellness and illness that um, I'm not talking about a movement back and forth, but is there a space between that there that is studied or a part of how we need to learn and think about who we are and who others are? And um, then that second question that may tie in a little bit to it is you said that your brain is a collection of maps and that that's not a metaphor. I've heard throughout my early adult life of the 
mean a map. You say it's a collection of maps. So my brain went, okay. I think of a map and I think of many cities, towns, rivers, mountains, you know, geo uh, 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 spaces. And now I'm hearing maybe it's a collection of maps. It's not just the map of Tallboro inside the map of North Carolina, inside the map of the USA, inside the map of the world. It's lots of maps. That's how I interpret it. So do I need help? <laughs> No, no, I'll, I'll explain that. That's a very common confusion because of the way the terms that we use. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start with the first one, which was a, you know, a very big question, which we could probably spend the whole time talking about. Um, but, um, you know, I think we are still sort of, we're still figuring out how to think about mental illness in relation to, um, you know, the variety of human th human kind of thought and emotion and, and tendencies that um, that exist in, in, the, in our general population. Um, and so kind of one thing that, you know, th there are kind of two things to think about. One, there's many things, but two things um, that I, I kind of juxtapose. One is that there's there's no question, you know, mental illness, um, when you get to the point of, of sort of severe illness can be um, so incapacitating and debilitating. It can be um, such a challenge for people and it can be life threatening um, in many cases. So it, it is, you know, such a serious public health concern that people who have mental illness and are struggling with it need um, a lot more support than our society gives them. You know, we really don't have parity for mental health. We, we don't help people with a with a you know acute mental challenge the way that we help people um, who are having a heart attack or you know having um, a, a physical ailment um, that that we can kind of pinpoint in a more direct way um, and so unfortunately that means that that people go without help um, in our society and um, and and that's to the detriment of all of us um, but um, also, I think it's important to think about the fact that mental illness, as we kind of typically define it, is is really part of a spectrum of uh, of our whole population that we that we all have different tendencies, and that in fact, you know, some of the tendencies, which you know, in kind of an extreme form or or under when we're under stress or or in in an environment that is not supporting us, we may those tendencies could become, you know, an is illness. Is depression illness? Yeah, so so depression, you know, or depression, depression, depending on where it is, just a part of mental wellness that needs it can go a lot of ways, right? Or it can go high or low, I should say. Yeah, so we so we have tendencies. So we might have somebody with kind of who is not mentally does not have a major depression, um, but is um, has a tendency toward depression or depressive thought. Um, or some kind of thought patterns or some sort of emotional responses that that are in that vein. And they may be, you know, at higher risk than if we put them in a situation where they they are, you know, uh, under a great deal of, of stress or, or, you know, or something else happens. So <clears throat> there can be tendencies that can be more mild that can then get exacerbated and become illness. And then, you know, for something like depression, we can also kind of move out of that period of acute illness and, and get better and no longer be acutely depressed, um, but still have those tendencies that are kind of part of our, 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 our temperament or our character. Um, and those, those, some of those tendencies themselves, there's more evidence, you know, needn't be thought of as, as, as harmful or bad in and of themselves, that in some in environments and circumstances, some of these tendencies like, like anxiety or depression could be reflecting when they are non-acute. Um, and not severe, they can actually be to some degree adaptive and help us to, for example, if if you're not anxious enough in dangerous situations, um, you know, you could you could have a terrible accident. Um, so yeah. anxiety is is beneficial. And, and with depression too, being able to see the world um, not through rose uh, tinted glasses, being able to see things in a kind of more clear eyed perspective, which which could which could come, we don't know, but could come with a kind of having that tendency. So if the brain if the brain is a collection of maps, and I'm still getting my brain wrapped around that, mm -hmm. I thought, when I think of a collection of maps in here, I think perhaps that is an indication of schizophrenia, or is schizophrenia when you have multiple personalities or such. I thought everybody had one map with a lot of roads on it. So you just completely reframed my thinking. We look at though, 
uh, how you have intersected or shared real life stories with the research you've done and are bringing this information forward. Did you ever wonder or did you ever search slash find that there's an opportunity to remap? And is, would that be a good or a bad thing? I mean, if people are mentally ill, does remapping tinker with the nature, naturalness of who they are? Is it a journey they take building it through experience and conversation and rethinking? Or is it something that like with the heart, we can go in and do a physical surgery? that alters and creates a better wellness for someone? That's a scary question. <laughs> it is, it's a big, it's a big question. Uh, let me just rewind a oh, little bit. Oh, you said big, I said scary. Okay. Scary, and, scary and big, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, so, uh, so let me, um, so, you know, it's, it's challenging because there are a lot of um, sort of different conceptualizations out in the general public about, about, um, mental illness and what it is, and also about the brain. And, and there's a lot of conceptualizations in, in the scientific community, um, you know, and we certainly don't have it figured out at all. And about uh, what wellness looks like. What does wellness look like? Who decides what wellness is? Yes, yes. Well, and I think that is one of the one of so, okay, so I would I want to I want to talk about that. But first, I just <laughs> wanted to back, I wanted to backtrack. So, um, you know, uh, so a couple things. One is that um, so schizophrenia um, is a is a you know, form of psychosis. Um, it's not actually it's commonly you know people often talk about it being kind of version of a multiple personality disorder, but it, it's it's actually very different than that. Um, it's it's a it's a very it's not uh, doesn't relate to multiple personalities, but has more to do with um, kind of different ways in which there's sort of um, a disconnection between kind of one's internal state and reality that can that can you know be reflected in things like hallucinations, hear, hearing voices, kind of having delusional thoughts. Um, so so that you know is kind of good to, to just make sure that everybody knows. Um, and then in terms of the map, so um, you had asked me about you know the, is the brain one big map or many maps, um, and and the way I kind of talk about it in my book is, you know, when we, we often talk about mapping the brain as, as scientists, and what we really mean by that is we're trying to figure out what all the parts do. Um, and it's sort of like if someone gave us a car, oh, I'm so sorry. It's like if somebody gave us a car, too many gestures, uh, if someone handed us Oh, like, no, a car, no, no, it's great. It <laughs> so if someone handed us a car, just, you know, put a, put a car in front of us, and we didn't know how it worked. And we wanted to figure it out. We'd start taking the pieces apart and we'd say, well, this piece came from here. What does it do to make the car run? This piece comes from here. So in a way, what we're really doing is kind of generating an inventory of locations and functions. And so that's the kind of mapping that you often hear about when you hear about um, how scientists and, are, are mapping the brain and understanding its layout. Um, right. And so what I'm referring to in the book are that if you take one of these areas, these like pieces of the brain that we have kind of tried to identify and say this, this bit of brain does, seems to do X or X and Y and Z more is probably more accurate because each brain bit is doing multiple things. Um, if you were to zoom in on that brain bit and when you look really closely and you can listen to what the cells are doing in that brain bit, um, many of these brain areas actually form literal maps of our experience. So maps of, of what we're seeing that are mapped out according to the locations um, of our visual field. So where things are happening relative to our gaze. Um, maps of our body surfaces that allow us to, to feel touch or you know, feel pain and know where on our body those things are happening. Um, and and a maps of hearing. I mean, many, many maps, maps of the spaces around us. And so these are all little maps that are kind of fitted within that bigger inventory that we talked about. Um, and so that's the explanation there for how you can have multiple maps. Um, and then, you know, one thing I wanna, wanna kind of make sure 
it, you know, when we think about mental illness, it, it's kind of one of our primary things that we want to understand about the brain. And unfortunately, it's also one of the like, toughest nuts to crack. We, we, you know, we um, yeah. in, in, in neuroscience and, and, um, and, and clinical psychology kind of are grappling with the fact that we can find differences on average between a brain of somebody who is diagnosed with a particular mental disorder and brain of somebody who's not or groups of people who are and are not. But that information hasn't so far really translated for us being able to say, you know, this is why mental illness happens. This is where it happens. And, you know, be able to then say, if we make this change, we can change it. You know, we can undo it or or in some way remap it the way you were referring to. And so, so yeah. many of us grew up thinking that the brain instructs the body. As I listen to you, actually, it's a, it's a cooperative where the body's instructing the brain as well. What first got you interested in neuroscience? Yeah, um, well, yeah, I think it was, it, it was, it's kind of, to me, it feels like the ultimate riddle. I mean, it's the ultimate question. We, we, we have this subjective conscious experience of our world. You know, we, we feel things, we taste things, we hear things, we, we wonder things, and that seems very ethereal. And yet it's all created by this little organ that's smaller than a soccer ball. I mean, it's really, our brains are not that impressive in, in, in size or, you know, they're, they're just an organ, but they do so much. And, and we really are at just the beginning of understanding how they do this. Um, and, and the questions of how they do it are so important for understanding why our experience is the way it is. Um, and so the book and the maps that I talk about, you know, they're really like the kind of just the, the, the first step, the foundations of understanding and tackling those questions. These maps um, were discovered, some, you know, the first map to be discovered was discovered in the, the, the 1800s. And, you know, they, they have been discovering more and more since then. Um, and so they're- in Wait some a ways, minute, wait a minute. So in the 1800s, we're thinking people were still at a highest level using microscopes, okay? Now you have so much digitally enhanced ability to look, see. You're saying they knew it back then. Yeah, well, and that really illustrates that the foundations of um, neuroscience and psychology, a, a lot of it came from observing things in patients and, and being kind of like Sherlock Holmes and deducing things that you <laughs> couldn't physically see in the brain, but that you could make observations and make, start to draw tentative conclusions. And so, you know, the first map, um, you know, was kind of jointly observed in humans um, by a neurologist who was watching how people who had seizure, certain kind of seizures, how the seizures would travel through their body and use that information to, to actually just kind of surmise and well, deduce. That was in the 1800s or before that? That was in the 1800s, yes. Okay, yes. all right. And, and, so, and so they were able to look at this patient and then got the idea that they could map about the brain. Yeah, so he was observing, he would he would see that people were getting, you know, people might have like a, a head wound or something in a certain part of their head and and then they would um, start having seizures. So that can happen mm -hmm. if you have a head trauma. And um, he was observing that across patients, you know, their seizures would start in different parts of their body, but it would always, the seizures would always start by traveling along kind of a certain path. So if it started in your hand, it would, you know, it would never travel from this hand to this hand. It would always travel you know, from your hand to your arm or your, or your hand to your face, actually. So there are specific ways in which it would travel and other ways it would never travel as it started to spread. And based on that information, those kind of observations, both about where the trauma was in the brain and how the convulsions, the, the seizures traveled, he, start, he started piecing together what the human brain map for movement looked like, um, which is, you know, I think, you know, pure Sherlock Holmes. It's really pretty fascinating. And then, then, then people, other people, other scientists around the same time started to um, use like little electrodes to test the maps of in animals and be able to show that animals also had body movement maps um, that were laid out according to their body. Well, what about you? Did you have any favorite moments or aha moments about the brain during your studies and research? Oh, man, that's a great question, because I, I feel like, you know, the, the great thing about science is, is 
that maybe once a week you have an aha moment <laughs> where you can, <laughs> especially with the brain, there's just so many levels and there's so many exciting ways that what, you know, we're learning and studying um, in this organ r relates to our lives. Um, so I'm, I'm actually having trouble, you know, picking up on one particular aha moment. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, when I was doing research, when I was in graduate school, I, my research was in visual perception. And, um, and it, I was studying kind of object recognition and how we, we recognize, for example, faces and bodies and how that is um, uh, carried out in the brain. And- um, Isn't there a movie star, Rebecca, isn't there a movie star who recently, like within the last couple of months, we learned they are having trouble distinguishing people by face. And it's happened in their, I think they're in their forties and it's, it's happening for them. And so they've had to remove themselves from their career because of that oh, to some know, degree. I, have, I haven't heard about that. I don't, I don't always know the kind of latest what's going on. Um, yeah, they, they specifically said they have trouble with facial recognition and i thought i'm going to be talking with rebecca i'm curious about this and then you mentioned it yes yeah so this is a condition that's actually quite widespread and in the book i talk about there's actually face recognition even just you know across the population there's quite a wide range of of kind of abilities that it's sort of it's sort of um it's really even though we think of it as something universal that everybody can do. That's that's not the case. That um, for a lot mm -hmm. of people, you know, they they may be you know, and we're still figuring out exactly why um, they they really from birth kind of have just not been very good at, or in some cases have really been just incapable of recognizing the faces of others. And you know, there there are kind of our multiple, and this can also happen later in life if you have damage to certain parts of your brain that that help you to recognize faces. So that was actually how we kind of first began to learn about these areas is again, brain damage would lead to somebody who could no longer recognize their, you know, spouse's face. Rebecca, and, and that would, Rebecca, that was a clue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so there's so many questions to ask you. I agree with you. Each of these could just be a whole conversation in itself. And maybe we should consider that uh, right now, though, there are so many people who are questioning themselves in ways they didn't before we all went home just over two years ago to figure out how, how and if we would live through COVID. When we think about it, is let me use something that's very common to all of us, okay? And then something very uh, that I care a lot about. Now, the thing that's common to all of us is that we've all learned that dyslexia is a thing. Is dyslexia an illness or is it a condition? We also, and this one I care deeply about, autism. And I do a lot of work and care and promotion of Holly Rod because they're doing incredible work to help people live well with autism, live their best lives, I should say, with autism. You probably, and scientists like you, are doing research to actually discover more about it. Um, so what's the difference between a condition and an illness? Do they overlap? And where do dyslexia and autism fit when we think about that, especially in an enlightened age of DEI, you know, diversity uh, and inclusion? How do, we, how do we look at it? Yeah, I think that is a fantastic question. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think that also people in the field are thinking about because it's, you know, we, it's challenging because we had sort of um, psychiatry in, in particular had to sort of develop, um, um, you know, over time has developed diagnoses sort of, it, and, and there are lots of reasons to have diagnoses and diagnoses have a lot of benefits that if you, if you can say, this is, this is the pattern that I'm seeing in this patient, then a, then a clinician can say, oh, you know, in other patients with this pattern, this is what has been able to help them the most. And, and um, so that there's a benefit to that, but also to some degree, what, what we see is that there's a lot of, even within putting people in the same box, right, in the same 
in the same diagnosis, we find that there's there's often quite a bit of um, variability, the differences, so that you've put them in the same box, but they're actually different manifestations of what we're calling the same condition or the same illness um, are very different. And on top of that, there are kind of especially in, in between for what you were describing with dyslexia um, and autism and also ADHD and, and some other kind of conditions that sort of often begin very early in life um, and, and, you know, are kind of just reflecting a different way of the brain working, that there are differences there, but this is also not in a, can, that those differences can create challenges, but they, they are not a lesser kind of way of the brain to work. They just, they, they are a different way for the brain to work, right? And so what I think we have to also think about is as when we talk about conditions that are, you know, like not neurotypical. So there's, there's a kind of a language of saying is something neurotypical or is it neurodivergent or it's kind of just different than what we consider typical. And so I think there's a, a movement to sort of change how we talk about conditions and realize that, um, you know, that somebody who kind of is neurodivergent, it doesn't mean that their their brain is not working as you know it's not like it's broken or it's not working as well it works differently and that leads to different strengths and different challenges and you know and what we want to do then is really kind of try to understand those differences but that we should make sure to understand them not in a way that stigmatizes and says you know you're sick because you're different or you know but and we want to fix necessarily you know we want to fix you because you're different what's important is to say you know how do we understand the differences in ways that can help you know, people with the specific challenges that they face. And I think that's um, a really important direction that we need to move in. And as many instances doing that, as I've seen again through some of the work and some of the results that have been achieved through Hollywood uh, organization, the foundation, uh, we actually all win better. It's not just about us being thought and inclusive human beings. It's about how we're winning from when we learn to see differences as opportunities. And you know, Rebecca, in a New York Times review of your book, Brainscapes, it was written, and I'm gonna quote it, in an exquisite choreography orchestrated by genes and the environment, our billions of brain cells create all kinds of special representations. What you ultimately see is warped by your brain maps. Break that down for our family listening right now so they can understand what that means in a simplified way and really leave our discussion with a better opportunity to think about themselves as well as others. Sure, so when we perceive the world around us, it's easy to think that, that that's the world that exists, that that's kind of what's out there and we're getting all the information that's out there as it is out there. But the truth is that actually what we get is a sliver of the information in our environment. And, um, and so the, the brain maps, when, we, when scientists studied the brain maps and, and were able to look at them up close and learn about their organization, um, you know, we learned that these maps yeah. are warped in ways that actually um, help us to survive. And so a great example of what I mean by warped is I had talked um, earlier about um, a visual map that allowed that represents um, in the physical tissues of our brain across the surfaces of our brain. Um, physically, the, the activity of the cells, so the, 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 the electrical activity of cells is corresponds to where light is striking our retina, which corresponds to where things are in space. And um, so the, so there's there's a map you know in our brain representing basically the, the visual information coming in, but it's it's warped so that the part that's representing where we're pointing our eyes is just you know it's like a hundred times more represented. I mean literally a hundred times kind of better higher fidelity representation than the representation of what's coming in the corner of our eyes. And if you think about it, you know, even though we never really notice it, of course, the vision in the corner of your eyes is is, is terrible, which is why you know we why we move our eyes constantly to see well. Um, and so what we have where done, I grew up, where, hey, hey Rebecca, where I grew up and where I still live in many, they say people give you the side eye, you know, like 
they can see out of that space that you're describing really gets warped and they got that clear vision. <laughs> so I think, it, I, 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 I think it's incredible where you're going with this. And I, I'm wondering if what you're talking about now is leaning in on where you wrote about the brain evolving and as it evolves, the brain maps get distorted to save energy and space. Is that kind of tied to this same conversation? Yes. Yeah, so, so the the so I go into the book why we have maps, and it 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 winds up the the, the short answer is that it, it you know it saves energy and space for our brain. So it allows us to represent more information in a more space efficient manner. So we don't have heads that are the size of beach balls, um, which would be very unfortunate for us. Um, but, it, it, you know, the warping also is helping us with that. And so what it does is, you know, if we have this much chunk of brain that we can we can dedicate to this visual map, for example, you know, we could just dedicate everything, you know, equally to the visual space, but then we wouldn't really, we kind of have crummy vision everywhere. And so what we, by doing this, this is this great trade-off where by kind of uh, warping and blowing up our kind of ability to perceive the visual center of gaze at very high resolution, and then this, the, the the periphery at kind of poor resolution. We get this ability to have you know a sweet spot where we can get really clear, really crisp vision, and then still have a, a kind of enough in the the side um, periphery to be able to detect if you know someone's sneaking up on us or something you know there's movement that you know there's a, there's a panther coming um so you know the the kind of, so it's like this great trade off where we can get see a lot not very well and then see a little very well and then move our eyes so that we get to see you know things very well when needed um you know, it's it's a great trade off so you can make more of that little chunk of of brain um and well, so you that's know something so, so something I found really interesting, we're going to talk all over each other, like we're on that show called The View. Huh? Um, <laughs> there, 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 there's uh, something, though, that, that was really interesting in a Bloomberg interview, and it was around how we think about time. Now, you used a quote about how the map is not the territory and described how we use our brain maps for space, but we don't have maps for time. I, I don't know if I'm getting it right or not. But can you go deeper on how our brains perceive and process time over the last couple of years with people living through COVID and some not, we've all witnessed different relationships to time. We can't believe it's been two years. Oh my God, I, did, I didn't think ever end. You know, wow. You mean we went from research to vaccinations. Wow. Wow. I lived through, you know, and we, we just got all these relationships that we attach to time, okay? We even pay for based on time, you know? We, we, we look at a skill set, but then when we start to pay, we think about time. And so can you talk about it a little bit and go deeper on how our brains perceive and process time, given that most poets write or acknowledge we've only got so much time here? <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So I should always be careful to say there's no brain maps for time because we, we don't know <laughs> all about every piece of brain. So, you know, with that caveat, um, you know, we haven't found maps for time, um, but there, of course, our brain can process and represent time. So how does it do that? Well, you know, um, so there's some evidence that one of the things that we do um, is that we take our, you know, our maps for space, for example, and we take our kind of aptitude. We're very good with, with space and location. Um, and, and our brains really are, those maps are, are primarily made to reflect those, those strengths. Um, but we can, you know, so a lot of times what we do is we use space to think about time. And we do this in a couple of different ways. I mean, one way is just, for example, you know, I walked, um, you know, I walked from my house to Jimmy's house. And so I think that it's probably been about 10 minutes since I left the house because I went this far. Right. So there, there are ways mm -hmm. we can kind of figure out time based on space. Um, or I, I wrote two pages on my manuscript. So I figure I probably had a half. Yeah. Well, not a half hour, but, you know, two hours or something. Um, <clears throat> but then we also use analogies. Um, 
And uh, so one way, for example, that we do that is, you know, we, when we are reasoning about time in kind of a, um, a more flexible fashion, like what what happened first? Did you know, was it which happened first, the, the Revolutionary War, or the Civil War, for example, you know, we're thinking about like things relative to each other in time and we tend to do that spatially. So and how we do that spatially, how we kind of mentally represent events in time spatially um, depends on our culture and, and actually how we learned in school to read and to have sort of timelines in our classroom so that, you know, in 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 um, cultures like, you know, ours where, you know, you're reading English and you're going from left to right when you read and the timelines go from left to right, we tend to think of things from the past as happening on the left of us and things that are further forward in time going to the right. Um, and it's it's really arbitrary. Other cultures that read, you know, in the opposite direction do the opposite. But the idea is that we just kind of have this way of switching time to space to think about it more flexibly. Um, and we then can use our spatial brain maps to help us do that. Um, and then there are other parts of the brain, like like the hippocampus, um, which is a, a you know a very uh, a kind of amazing brain area that's kind of tucked deeper within the brain that um, that doesn't seem to have maps in the same way that the maps I described. So there are parts of the brain that don't really operate through maps. They actually have a, a kind of a very different um, sort of way of representing information, and they're they're better at learning sort of being able to sort of represent very new things. Um, and so actually that that area of the brain is, is also important for processing time and, and for memory. You talk about uh, uh, processing time and memory and representing an opportunity for new things. A lot of your work fo focuses more on children and development. Um, and since that's the case, how do you think the situations around COVID and the lockdowns of the past few years have had an impact on children versus adults? I was in uh, speaking with a friend in North Carolina and he mentioned to me, he said, you know, JBH, um, my baby does not know a time not living in COVID. Now, why that was important to him, I think, is because he was coming from a space of him growing up not in COVID, but he he started to wonder what that would mean long term for her and his other he has two other children who did know playground and classroom before COVID and got pulled from it. Are there any long term implications that we might learn from during this period that would support cognitive perspectives? That's a wonderful question. And, you know, I, I wish we knew more. I think um, we're going to learn a lot more, for better or worse, in the coming we years. We need the time to study. <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the, that that the disruption that COVID presented in basically, you know, all aspects of our lives really has laid bare that there are a lot of questions we, we really don't yet have answers to in terms of what are the key experiences in childhood that 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 help us help children to kind of formulate and develop the the maps that will allow them to do what they need to do later in life and you know how much like how much is enough so for example we we do know that you know people babies and children need to see faces in order to develop these these areas these face recognition areas i mentioned but um if you know is it enough to see just their parents faces it may be we don't know but you know we we you know it, you know is and and to what degree is seeing fewer you know seeing express facial expression just in the eyes versus the mouth how does that change is less you know less interaction with people what what are the impacts um and i think you know you know either way we kind of had to take the all we and we have we'll have to continue to take if if needed steps to to make sure that we're prioritizing you know health and safety um of 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 um of our population so things like masking and social distancing when needed um in the past and 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 it and you know hopefully not too much in the future but if if necessary <laughs> we can do that um you know but it, it is it is true that you know i think that that we still have more to understand about what are the basic inputs to child experience that and how do those Kind of impacts um, 
you know, what are the downstream effects of the changes to those experiences later in life? And, and we're really in the process of, of, of learning and, and, and trying to adjust to what we do learn about that. But we do know that that early age is very important for brain development and for also socio-emotional development. Um, and so one thing that is crystal clear already is that um, children, um, uh, you know, and adults, but, you know, I think it, particularly children have have kind of are, there's a mental health crisis out here out, out there. So, you know, COVID, we already know, has had an impact on, um, you know, children's development in ways that are at least in, in children's um, sort of ability you know but to Rebecca cope. have we always been have we always been a village you know it takes a village to raise a child have we always been a village yeah it, I mean is, is it is it adult is it adult response to COVID that's impacting children or is COVID an unnatural state for a you know the, the the response we had to COVID is that just an unnatural state for us because we've been focusing mostly on human brains and everybody's got to get brain state. It's just incredible. Uh, but um, is, do we need the village? I mean, I know, um, you know, we need male and female to come together to create a human being. Uh, we need certain qualities of that, you know, from a gender perspective, not from a gender perspective, but from a cellular perspective, how do we, how, how, how are we thinking about this? Are we, are we training for crisis or mental illness based on, on societal things we set up, or is there a science thing in it? I guess is the question. Yeah. So, I and think, I don't know if that's why you can answer. <laughs> I think here's here's what I think I can say, which is that I I think that you know you're setting up a really important distinction, which is that you know there's a question about what are the you know sort of developmental the inputs in development that um you know what are the impacts of de developmental impacts and that's that's a scientific question and then there's kind of a, a secondary you know kind of um you know laden stigmatizing question about like you know what is the better childhood or is there like a you know a way that it, you should be raised that would be ideal and I think mm -hmm. it's first of all you know it's 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 essential to say off the bat that that you know no there is no one way of raising children and there's there isn't an one single ideal for you know how the kind of loved you know as long as a child has love and support and security that can come from you know any different kind of different sources and um you know but you know we do want to make sure that we do give children the 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 security and and the the, the opportunity for kind of um attachment and you know you know so rate so allowing children to to you know you know be living in poverty in extreme poverty and stress and and, and allowing families to be in extreme poverty and stress that is gonna add place added burdens on the family and on the child um but that in societies where that is out of the norm in societies where that is out of the norm, I yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, I see, yes, I see what you're saying. So a lot of like stress can be also kind of relative poverty. So that like you're saying, yeah. if you're in an environment where the whole community, this is the lifestyle and it's a different kind of um, sort of, there's a different standard for, you know, and you also a different standard for kind of shared resources or for sort of family or, living. Or going or back to where, or going, Going back to where the scientists who you referenced early in our conversation discovered the uh, some ideas around mapping in the 1800s, what was normal then would be poverty now, you know, and so 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 you know that that tiny thing as well, uh, which really underneath my question, moving away from socio you know societal and going back to just the science of it. How does a person develop a personality? I mean, is there a formula to it or is it a combination of nature and nurture? How does a person develop a personality? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Uh, and I don't have an answer for you on that. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's something we're still trying to figure out. And certainly there uh, is a lot of work trying to understand you know, the, what are they, the, the early building blocks of um, temperament? And, you know, are there certain particular neural processes that 
predispose a newborn baby to be more anxious or kind of more, you know, adventurous or, or, or all the other kind of ways in which we know that, you know, any, any parent or, uh, you know, adult has seen babies have their own kind of personality to some degree, you know, there's some of that already when they're born. Um, so, you know, that's a great question. And I, and I, um, and I don't, I don't have an answer for it, but I, you know, I know that there's exciting work going on, um, trying to, trying to answer it. Um, and I, and I also want to get back to the, the last question to just to add, I think, I think that what you're also highlighting, which is important, um, is that culture is, you know, culture is an important part of, of, of um, development and a, of the human condition. And it's something that we often ignore in neuroscience. Um, and so first of all, we tend not to study, you know, different cultures with different lifestyles very much. We sort of assume they're all like our culture and lifestyle. And we tend to kind of, it's, it's very easy to, there is certainly a history in neuroscience of kind of ha coming with a mindset that there is one ideal way of, of growing up, one ideal kind of brain way of being. And that's something that, that I, I absolutely think we, we need to move away from. I, I don't think it's mm -hmm. beneficial for our science or for kind of how we then think about and talk about our findings. You know, that provokes another question for me, and that is, and, and this is going back to children and the brain development. Are there ways that brain mapping can be useful, Rebecca, in informing how we educate children? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, I, I think that, you know, just, I think an awareness of how, for example, we are quite literally taking things like our timelines and, and our kind of spatial maps and using them to represent more um, kind of ethereal or less concrete things like time um, is, uh, is, is can be helpful. You know, I mean, I think that can be helpful for helping teachers understand why other techniques might work. I mean, I think that there's a, a, such a great education literature out there already showing that, for example, people might learn well in different ways and, you know, sometimes taking something abstract and drawing a picture of it, putting it in some physical spatial form is very helpful for us to uh, understand it so that the, the educational findings are there. But I think, you know, it can take you another step to just understand why that is what like, why should we, you know, why would a picture tell a 1000 words sometimes in, in these instances. And um, so I, I think that's kind of the benefit there. I remember when my son and, and my daughter were toddlers in toddler school, and uh, I was very involved with the teachers and with the curriculum and the environment. The school embraced that. And I remember uh, teacher Miss, Miss, a, Miss uh, Andrea said, um, you know, I discovered that Brett really engages a lot of his senses during his learning and he can learn in different environments. He can be an audio learner. He can be a visual learner. Uh, and she was saying the distinction between how kids learn was so important. And you take me back to that with your conversation. Um, Rebecca, Map in the Brain does have some clear implications in the medical field, though, and I don't know what your thoughts are on the technology side. I'd love to know them. We all know that uh, people like Elon Musk see the potential for things like Neuralink, where they're hoping to link brains and computers together someday. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, good, bad, possible, inevitable? <laughs> uh, complicated. <laughs> I would say... <laughs> Scary I, to take a position on. <laughs> Don't want it canceled. <laughs> no, 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 I'm happy. I mean, I'm happy though to share my thoughts on it, but to saying that it's complicated in that it's it's not all good or or all bad. I think that the um, you know, the 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 neural kind of the developing neural technology and certainly the the sort of brain computer interfaces that mm -hmm. will kind of some you know the idea that we'll someday be reading our minds or you know we could be sharing our thoughts um uh through the internet you know through our head devices so those things you know those things may may still happen but we're not there we're not we're not there yet um but, but there are technologies that are finding at least in the short term that they can help people with um who are kind of paralyzed um and uh, you know give them some ability to for example control a cursor on a, on a computer screen or a robotic arm and give them some, um, you know, some 
agency or uh, in their world that they didn't have otherwise because of their kind of um, injury. And so that I think that that illustrates the, the potential benefit of technologies that that try to bridge that divide between um, between brains and computers and, and allow us to kind of, you know, but at the same time, I do have <laughs> major, major privacy concerns. Um, yes. yes. So I feel like, you know, what I think we should be doing right now is, I mean, I don't think we're, we're not on the cusp of, of, of having an implant that's, you know, gonna, but I do think that there are actually are ways in which, you know, less direct interfaces could be, um, could call information, neural information that is less detailed, but still combined with other information about ourselves, you know, could be a, a privacy issue. And certainly we already have privacy issues because, you know, there are some very large companies that we, you know, operate with like, like Facebook or Google that we, that we wind up spending a lot of our time interacting with in one form or another. And, and, and they, you know, they, they are collecting information about us, um, you know, and so we have to think very carefully, I think, at this stage about um, sort of what are the lines that we want to draw in the sand about, you know, what kind of is and is not an okay use of information from that might be collected from our brain, say in that like even a headband or a hat, um, and 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 who are we okay with having it, and 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 what rights do we have? You know, we have rights to um, privacy for our health information. Um, so like, how would we count something like kind of data collected from our brains? We should be laying this out, and we should be clarifying this now because there is a lot of investment going on. Um, uh, to try to move those technologies forward, and we we want to have we want to have um, we want to have our rights known and articulated and established before we get to that stage. Well, what are the uh, potential breakthroughs in neuroscience that you're the most excited about, or even hoping for? Um, that's a great question. I um, you know, I'm really. So my work is focused on sensory over responsivity. We were talking about autism earlier and so how, you know, many neurodevelopmental disorders have um, uh, sort of uh, people who, who experience these conditions have kind of sense dif differences with sensory response. So things that might feel, you know, not upsetting or not overwhelming for one person, you know, but the same sound or sa a same sensory touch sensation would be overwhelming and very upsetting and mm -hmm. create anxiety mm -hmm. and create um, distress. Um, so, you know, one thing that I've been trying to do is to try to understand kind of what the basis is for those differences, um, hoping that it can kind of be in, inform us um, in terms of, you know, so I think one of the one of the things that we are struggling with in, in neuroscience is sometimes we uh, we run studies where we we try to answer a really big question. We have a, a whole lot of data um but sometimes i think you know as a result we kind of don't get a fine-grained enough measure to be able to answer the specific questions and we kind of don't necessarily do any of it very well if we have too much general data and then try to answer our specific questions so i i, I am hopeful i'm really i think it'd be really exciting to see more crosstalk between the tremendous amount of research that's happening in neuroscience that's being carried out with with animals where you can kind of do you can you know have a better sense of the fine-grained information processing that's happening in their brains or or you know you can scan them just like you would put us you can put a human in a scanner and we could compare for example what you know when you when you do a brain scan for a monkey and you do a brain scan for a human and and how are those similar and different and so being able to try to translate between the, the literatures that we have the the data we have from humans with kind of the limited techniques that we can do with humans and then just decades and decades of research that has been learned from work with animals and, and you know, um, uh, sea slugs and all kinds of little creatures. So um, I think that could really be transformative and, and I hope there'll be more crosstalk. Well, you know, I am just so not simply amazed, but also appreciative of what you know and how you understand the brain so well. Are there any ways that you've been able to improve your own cognition because of your understanding? I mean, do you have any hacks or tricks or, you know, puzzles or anything that uh, help you to improve your brain function in any way? 
Oh boy. I, I wish, I wish I did. I think coffee would be probably <laughs> my best answer. Uh, I mean, I have young children too. So I think, you know, I feel as if, um, uh, just the hack is just to, for me is just to be as efficient as I can with the time that I have and to forgive myself when, you know, the kids get sick and things don't get done. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, we've been having lots of discussions, especially in a lot of women's leadership groups, but in most of our executive uh, conversations and management uh, uh, leadership uh, sessions around forgiving yourself and taking care of yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually. Listen, we're going to play four for four before we get out of here. I'm going to ask you four questions to which you'll give me four answers. And there are no right or wrong answers. It just helps us to learn from you, get to know you, and appreciate perchance ourselves a little bit better as we hear how you are doing this. So the first of the four, Rebecca, is you get to invite four people to dinner from any time. They can, be, they have, can already have transitioned or they can be alive now. Not the future people, but those who are alive now or those who transition. They can be from history who you've heard about. But who's going to be at your table? Oh, um, uh, boy, <laughs> I should be ready for this, but I am. Ooh, um, I would say. I would, uh, oh, boy, can we come back to this one? <laughs> we sure can, because you got to tell us why they're there as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll move to the second one and come back to the uh, first one. Um, what are the four different uh, pieces of music you're listening to right now, especially if there's any you share with my family? You know, our family is a across the globe listening to you right now. So what are the four pieces of music you're listening to or offers and why? Artists. Um, boy, okay. So I am, I have been going with my daughter. My daughter is, um, is, is, is reaching teenagerhood. And so she is, um, she has been introducing me to, um, uh, kind of, she's both been discovering some of the artists that, you know, she, she, uh, connects to as a teenage girl and, um, some of them I knew and some of them I didn't. Um, so that's been kind of fun. So we've been learning, I, you know, I, um, I learned about, um, um, oh my goodness. I am having trouble with her name right now. I, I do not. That Grab is, your that, phone. Grab your yeah. phone. Yes. If it's um, on your playlist, what's on your playlist? Yes. Yeah. All right. Give me, give me a second here. Uh, um, I, I have a terrible time. Billie Eilish there. <laughs> I have a terrible oh, time placing God. names. You know, people are laughing right now going, she had to think of Billie Eilish. <laughs> I know, I know, you know, it's funny. And this is the way, and this is another thing, you know, being forgiving that brains work differently. So for me, yeah. you know, I can know, this happens to me with you know, people I see, like I know, I, I know all these things about them, but like I, you know, either can't remember the name or can't can't get it to come up quickly. Right, right. So, right. Um, so this is this is my thing, and so I'm like, Billy oh, is one, and it's probably at the top of a lot of people's list. You got three more. I I know. Well, you I, got your phone. Huh? I, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, oh, okay. So, um, I also I learned about Halsey. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm sure everybody's yeah. laughing at me. You know, it's yeah. just I, yeah. I don't know. I think I spent too much time reading books and um in the recent years and raising kids uh -huh. and didn't hear any cool artists. Mm -hmm. Um I learned about um uh let's see what is uh Olivia Rodrigo. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And um and then my daughter's also been listening a lot to Katy Perry, who I knew Katy Perry. But just, you know, it's hearing yeah. the artists that she is kind of connecting with right now. And that's been fun. 
Um, it's interesting though, because you've been listening together. Do you know s- several of my guests listen alone? They go straight to what they get to listen to when they are by themselves. I think it's a beautiful thing that you're sharing what you're listening together, you know? And yeah. two together and with your daughter. That's just lovely. Thank you. That's really beautiful. I'm a little bit emotional about it, actually. That's really beautiful. Oh. Well, I okay. Feel, you know. So, what for book? Yeah. yeah for books? Feel what now? Oh, no, I was what just going to say. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I feel like it's a, you know, you know, with teenagers, you don't have that much longer with them. And I just want to share things with her and be part of her world. And so. I think, I think that's wonderful. I'm sure you're learning a lot as you listen to, not just about her, but from the music. Music has been an incredible teacher. And the reason I ask that uh, question is because music has been so instrumental in my life, not just to how I connect with it and how it helps, informs, or allows me to move forward from moment to moment. I grew up listening to Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? you know, uh, and and um, that album still is on my playlist and I still have the vinyl. Uh, I think about Beatles and how they broke down what was still a firm caste system in, uh, in, in the UK, you know, so, or, or songs, you know, that are sung in places of worship. So music is very informing and it, 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 it can sometimes be a bigger message than you know the conversation that one might have. So I think it's beautiful that you're sharing that experience with your daughter. Uh, what are the four books that you're reading that or have read that you would recommend to our family and why? Yeah. Um, so the I would recommend. recommend what about other brain? <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I will not. Um, rec- I will not recommend this. The, the <laughs> super oh, scientific stuff. But I've already recommended Brainscapes, so <laughs> so you got to go for more, for different. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I, I was gonna say. Um, uh, so on the kind of brain and psychology related side, um, a couple that I, um, one that I have actually just recently read is called Neurotribes by Steve Sil- Silberman. And um, uh, speaking of neurodivergent and, and neurodevelopmental conditions, and then um, uh, and then also uh, the Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould. So that is a little bit more of like a scholarly kind of, but it really talks about the, the ways in which, as we were talking about, there's sort of sort of the biases and stigmas of a, of a culture um, of kind of of scientists in a cult mm-hmm. embedded in a culture, <laughs> were then applied to the ways in which they studied psychology and the brain and um and those perpetuated these stigmas and these kind of cultural biases so i think that's something that every scientist should read um but i think it's actually it's a really good you know it's good for all of us to be aware that that science is embedded in in a culture and it's in, in the milieu and that culture you know biases get reflected often in the the work incredible that's two books that's two books so then um a couple of um other books that i read a couple of fiction books so i joined a book group recently which is i've never had time to do it that since like forever um so let me let me just look up the author here so okay. i went I, I enjoyed i read mexican gothic by sylvia mm-hmm. sylvia moreno garcia and that was really like really interesting i really liked how well, she somebody else just mentioned that to me someone else in a in a general conversation mentioned that book to me. Yeah, it was a really kind of engaging story, but then it was also really steeped in this history of, um, uh, uh, you know, of, of sort of uh, um, kind of European um, colonialism and, and sort of, you know, and, and it was woven together in a, in a, in a really beautiful way. Um, and then I recently read Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, and I, I found that very, you know, really interesting. and. Uh-huh really kind of transports you to a very different kind of society, but also lays bare some of these kind of ways in which we we talk about and think about race even today. But, you know, it's just, yeah. So very interesting, thought provoking. One of the things that uh, occurred for me as we were having our conversation 
was around uh, race. And as an African-American female of that age where I grew up in a segregated Southern community um, and attended segregated schools, um, there was um, fear slash, you know, stay away from um, mindset around when people started to study the brains in my own home uh, or talked about it in my own home. Um, it was quite different. It was like once they get in there and they study, they find that race is something we created that we bought into, but that really doesn't have a place in science, you know? So it's really interesting how when you talk about in the whole milieu of how we are looking at uh, our, our, our existence as human beings, uh, science is, is, is perhaps that thread that helps to helps us to exist together. I mean, we're, we're all looking at whether or not we believe or whether or not we will participate in, um, in environmental or ESG efforts, you know. Um, and does it offend who we are spiritually or does it help us embrace where we are physically? It's a big thing. It's a really big thing right now. And I'm excited that, uh, and one of the reasons I'm so excited about you being here is that we're able to see science part of how we live and not apart from how we live. So. Um, I, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and if you're ready to tell us who are the four people you would have at dinner, I would love to know that and why. Okay. All right. Um, so I, um, so since we were talking about John Hewlings Jackson, he's the neurologist who, yes. um, who, who did, and he seems like a very, I kind of got fascinated with him in writing the book because he, he, you know, he was super absent minded and, um, you know, but but brilliant. Um, and I would be interested to meet him and um, sort of, you know, learn more about him um, because he, he seemed sort of he seemed, he seemed interesting and I'm not sure that I would like him, you know, and he would certainly uh -huh. be, <laughs> he would again be embedded in that environment probably from he was, you know, in London high society you know in the 1800s and sitting at your table eating listening to billy eilish <laughs> yes oh yeah so i would love i would like to see you know what 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 he was like and and whether he you know um you know how he thought um and and you know and sort of how he how his society was reflected in his thinking as well um i um i would i would love to meet harriet tubman I've been kind of, uh, I, I, I keep like, I, I remember um, learning m more about her too with my children and being so shocked by her complete courage. And I thought, how could anybody be that courageous and strong? Um, and so I, I would want to, I would hope to get the life hacks about how to be, you know, your best, <laughs> your best, most kind of brave um and true self uh, from her and and learn about that you know where that bravery comes from and and how to harness I, it i think i i think and you would know this perhaps better from a brain perspective i think a clear vision or passion that has strong challenge to it is a big motivator for a lot of people i'm not suggesting that's what we need. I'm saying circumstantially as human beings, that's where we often operate from. You know, we believe, we desire, our vision is so clear on that thing and everything around us works against it. I think we, you know, whether it, it's something bigger than hooks, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, I think maybe there's something in the brain we can find out from there, or maybe, we'll find out how the heart works with the brain. You know, they have to cooperate, I think, in often uh, circumstances. Who else is that? Tim? <laughs> We've got Harriet there. Uh-huh, uh -huh. um, I think I, I think I would like to meet Virginia Woolf, <laughs> I think. Uh -huh. 
You go, Rebecca. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You go, yeah. girl. Why uh, is she going to be at that table? <laughs> uh, tell us why. Oh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think for it's funny, like both both Virginia Woolf and Sylvia Plath have this kind of place in my heart as 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 creative souls. Um, yeah. And um, and as people who, um, you know, were were kind of struggling, but also finding um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. finding kind of passion and vision and direction within, you know, you know, so much pain and so i think trying to understand that and learn about you know learn about them would be fascinating as well um yeah so and um and who, so, who's your fourth yet yes so um maybe i don't know maybe abraham lincoln i i feel i want to read a biography of him but i i do think um what i what i again like you know he and his his family went through a lot of pain and a lot of struggle and then he being trying to like steer the helm of a country at a time when there was so much division and i, I it would it would just be fascinating to to talk to you know how do you how do you navigate that and how do you um you know what that was was like from a first person perspective did you ever read the book forced to glory f-o-r-c-e-d no uh, but i will happily is that your recommendation <laughs> I'm not recommending it. I'm just curious if, if it informs you or, or gives you a, a broader thought on that as well. Um, and so with that, we are going four for four. Four pieces of advice you can share with our audience, Rebecca, whether it's your own. If it's advice someone has given you, will you share with us who and why? why you think this advice is important. Four pieces of advice. Four pieces of advice other people gave me that I would like to pass on. Or your own, or your own advice. Okay, all right, okay. Um, so, you know, I'll start with the one that I already said earlier, which is which is forgive yourself. Forgive yes. yourself like you would forgive your, your neighbor, your friend, your loved one. Be kind to yourself as well. Um, I would share, um, I would share, you know, and I think this is something that, something that I, I know I, I try to, I, I work on and try to remember whenever I'm interacting with someone else is that you, you never know where they've been, where they're going, what they're going through. And so just, you know, being really open-minded and kind of giving of the fact that, you know, we, we, you know, we're all struggling with something and how can, uh, you know, rather than if something, you know, if there's a disagreement, you know, trying to keep that in mind or, or, you know, I, I just think that, you know, we could do more of giving each other the benefit of the doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I, I usually I let's see, I'm not I don't like to give advice because I always <laughs> this is hard. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh, I would say, um, you know, remembering that there are many different ways that a mind can work and that there isn't one better way you know and um yeah i think like for ourselves and for others being kind of cognizant of that and that when you encounter someone who's different from you that 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 that's not a bad thing that that's that's a good thing and um and, and being willing to see you know, try to see the world through their eyes and and um, connect with them. Um, so that would be a third thing. And uh -huh. then I guess the fourth thing. These are all things I'm still I'm you know I'm working on as in addition to sharing. Um, um, oh, I lost it. Let's see. <laughs> uh, I think my fourth thing would be um, to. Um, to try to to live and give generously to wow yeah wow wow rebecca thank you is appropriate to say thank you so very much i don't know the word to express how much i have enjoyed this conversation with you i look forward to more conversation with you um, 
from my heart to your home. Thank you. I'm so filled with gratitude for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this so very much and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It was a joy.